Gelenia was the first pill for multiple sclerosis, originally FDA approved in 2010, and today we're going to review how it works, the results from clinical trials, including the relative efficacy compared to other disease-modifying therapies, and the side effects paying close attention to the risk of COVID-19, and I have some timestamps if you want to skip ahead. Let's have some fun. As usual, I would strongly recommend you talk to your own provider about disease-modifying therapy, although I'm happy to answer any questions in the comments below, so long as you phrase them in a general way, as I can't give you specific medical advice. Also, I'll include the links of some of my references in the notes below. And by the way, my name is Brandon Bieber, and I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday, so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. And if you find this video informative, please click like. So the way Gelenia works is by modulating the sphincter Sphingosine 1 phosphate receptor, which is a transmembrane protein on lymphocytes, a subclass of white blood cells heavily involved in inflammation in multiple sclerosis. And there are actually five subclasses of S1P receptors numbered 1 through 5. And it turns out that Gelenia works primarily through the S1P1 receptor. There's a newer drug called Zepanamod or Mazent that's more specific for the S1P1 receptor, although the side effects and efficacy of these two drugs are very similar and it's not clear that one is superior to the other. So essentially the way Gelenia works is it causes this receptor to internalize within the lymphocyte, the subclass of white blood cell that I was talking about, and the receptor is normally involved in egress or escape of the lymphocytes from the lymph nodes. So Gelenia traps the white blood cells within the lymph nodes so that they can't get out to attack the brain and spinal cord and optic nerve. So instead of killing white blood cells like some disease-modifying therapies, it essentially sequesters white blood cells within the lymph nodes. And it has preferential effects on naive and Th17-positive T cells, such that the effect on weakening the immune system is not so profound. In fact, people taking Gelenia often have very low levels of certain types of white blood cells, especially CD4 positive T cells. So when we look at their blood tests, it almost looks like they have AIDS, but they don't get a lot of the same infections that people with AIDS get, although they are at increased risk of certain types of viral infections, as we'll soon see. Gelenia is metabolized in the body by an enzyme called sphingosine kinase to the active metabolite, which is fingolimod phosphate, and it has a very long half-life of six to nine days. So it takes a long time to achieve steady state within the body, and even after you stop it, it hangs around in the blood for quite a long time, up to two months. Also, it is metabolized by the liver and then excreted by the kidneys, so generally this drug is not recommended to people with significant liver and kidney problems. Now we're going to look at three different clinical trials with Gelenia, and the first is the Freedoms trial, which was a study of two different doses of Gelenia, or fingolimod, versus placebo. So they studied both the 1.25 milligram dose and the 0.5 milligram dose, and both of these were given one tablet daily with or without food. Now we don't actually use the 1.25 milligram dose in practice because it didn't work any better than the 0.5 milligram group and it had increased risks. For instance, there were two cases of people who had disseminated shingles, a viral skin infection, with the higher dose. Also, there are some other studies showing potentially serious side effects with very high doses of Gelenia. There was one patient who received 5 milligrams of Gelenia and had a rare disease of the brain called posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, which is essentially leakiness of blood vessels in the brain causing swelling, and so that's why we don't use higher doses of Gelenia. But anyways, in this study they looked at a lot of different things. In this graph you can see the number of people who were free from relapses, and so it starts at 100% and then goes down slowly, and if you look at the two different doses of Gelenia, you can see that about 75% were free of relapses after 720 days versus only about 50% of those taking placebo. Another thing they looked at was disability progression, and you can see with placebo by the end of the study, about 25% had worsening of their disability, whereas in the two Gelenia groups, it was just a little bit over 15%. And they also looked at MRI lesions. In this case, they're looking at the percentage who did not have new gadolinium-enhancing lesions, or active lesions on MRI. And you can 
see after 24 months, it was about 90% of people were free of new active lesions on their MRI with the two different doses of Jelenia versus only about 65% taking placebo. So Jelenia was definitely better. And again, the two doses of Jelenia were about the same in efficacy, which is why we don't use the higher dose. And the usual dose is 0.5 milligrams once daily, although some people have experimented with less frequent dosing. The next study we'll look at is the TRANSFORM trial, which is a head-to-head -head study in relapsing MS of Jelenia versus Avenex, which is intramuscular beta interferon 1A once weekly, which is one of the lower efficacy disease-modifying therapies. And here they looked at annualized relapse rate, which is the average number of relapses per year. So in people getting Avenex, they had 0.33 relapses per year, or about one relapse every three years on average, but in the Jelenia Jelenia 0.5 milligrams daily group, they had 0.16 relapses per year, or about one relapse every six years. So they reduced attacks by about 50%. And again, the 1.25 milligram dose was actually slightly less effective in this study, which is why we don't use it. They also looked at the percentage of people who were free of relapses, and it was 80% and 83% in the two Jelenia groups versus 69% in the Avenex group. Now, these are both relapsing MS studies. They also tried Jelenia in primary progressive MS in the INFORMS trial, and here you're looking at three-month confirmed disability progression, but Jelenia was not effective. You can see placebo and Jelenia are right on top of each other in this graph, and so it's not really recommended in progressive MS. Interestingly, the very similar drug, Sapanamod or Mazent, was effective in a study of secondary progressive MS, although those individuals were on average slightly younger and more likely to have have active lesions. And if you want to learn more about treatments in progressive MS, I have a separate video on that topic. Now, it's very hard to know how effective medications are relative to one another in the absence of a head-to-head -head trial. So we know that Jelenia is better than Avenex because they specifically been studied head-to-head. -head. But this chart is just my personal opinion about where Jelenia lies in relation to other disease-modifying therapies. And I have a separate video that shows how I came to this conclusion. And I believe that Jelenia is likely less effective than monoclonal antibodies such as Ocrevus and Tysabri. And in terms of comparison to the pills, it's likely less effective than cladribine, but perhaps more effective than other pills such as Tecfidera, Vumeridae, and Abagio, and likely more effective than glutiramer acetate and interferons. And of course, not everyone would agree with this, and many of these combinations have not been specifically studied. This is just my personal opinion. So let's talk about some of the side effects of Jelenia. It turns out that the S1P receptors are also on the cardiac cells, and hence it can cause a slowing of the heart rate, or bradycardia. Now, interestingly, this typically occurs with the first dose and does not occur with other doses. And so when you take the medication, the heart rate goes down, but then it comes back to normal, and as long as you continue it, typically it doesn't cause any prolonged slowing of the heart rate. Although, if you don't take the drug for more than two weeks, your heart can essentially forget that it's seen Jelenia, and you can get this first dose bradycardia, or first dose slowing of the heart rate, once again. Now, typically, it causes a benign slowing of the heart rate that resolves spontaneously, but in rare cases, it can cause a serious heart conduction problem called AV block, or atrioventricular block, or even sudden cardiac death. So generally, this medication is not recommended to people with certain type of heart conduction abnormalities, and it can be a problem if people are taking other medications that affect the heart, such as blood pressure medications like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Now, typically, a first dose observation is recommended for six hours just to make sure that the heart rate goes down and then comes back up, and an EKG is recommended prior to discharge. Now, Jelenia can entrap the lymphocytes in the lymph nodes and make the white blood cell counts low, and it is associated with certain types of infections, not as much as we thought it would be. For instance, we don't think Jelenia particularly causes urinary tract infections, although it is associated with certain types of viral infections, in particular, zoster or shingles, which is a painful rash caused by the varicella zoster virus, the same virus that causes chickenpox. It can also cause a side effect known as macular edema or swelling of the back of the eye, which is actually reversible, but it's recommended to see an ophthalmologist 
prior to starting the medication and then four months afterwards so that it can be recognized and the drug can be stopped if macular edema develops. This side effect is more common in diabetes. It can sometimes cause uh, problems with the liver and elevation of liver function enzymes. It can also cause birth defects and is not recommended if you're trying to become pregnant and because of the long half-life it's recommended to stop at two months prior to attempting conception. In rare cases it can cause shortness of breath or an asthma-like side effect or sometimes other lung problems and another viral infection caused by the JC virus can rarely be seen, this is extremely rare, known as PML or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Another thing to note is that when you stop gelenia, the lymphocytes eventually come back and people have reported a rebound or worsening of multiple sclerosis. So many doctors recommend transitioning directly from gelenia to another disease modifying therapy and not allowing a washout period if you're going to change from this drug to another one for some one reason or another. What you're looking at here is a test called an OCT or ocular computed tomography to look at the macula in this dark fluid is swelling or edema. So this is macular edema. And again, if you stop gelenia, this is often reversible, but if allowed to continue, it could potentially cause permanent visual loss. And again, this is more common in diabetes. This is an example of shingles, a painful rash, and it can actually cause permanent pain if not treated immediately. And this is an MRI scan showing PML, or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, again, the rare brain infection caused by the JC virus. This is most associated with Tysabri. The risk in Gelenia is thought to be extremely low, perhaps about 1 in 18,000. Many people who test positive for the virus based on the blood test JC virus antibody are recommended not to take Tysabri, but many people who are positive are comfortable taking Gelenia. You also may be concerned about the risk of COVID-19 with Gelenia. Gelenia does entrap T cells, which are very important in fighting SARS-CoV-2, the virus which causes COVID-19, although as I said, the effector T cells are thought to be relatively spared. I would consider anyone to taking Gelenia to be at increased risk, although some of the early reports are favorable. This is data from a multiple sclerosis registry, and you can see there are over 1,200 cases, although all 77 take taking Gelenia survive. So there doesn't seem to be a major, major increase in mortality in people taking Gelenia, although there could be some bias in reporting. Interestingly, Gelenia is actually being studied as a potential treatment of the inflammation of the lungs associated with COVID-19, causing acute respiratory distress syndrome. But some people have speculated that it could even be beneficial in some people with COVID-19. But again, we don't know that for sure. I should also mention a couple other potential drug-drug interactions. So the antifungal agent ketoconazole, trade name Nizerol, which is used to treat fungal infections, increases the levels of gelenia in the blood by inhibiting a certain enzyme in the liver called CYP4F2. Also, certain drugs that work on the heart, such as amiodarone and drugs to use, treat high blood pressure even, can increase the risk of serious cardiac or heart side effects with gelenia. And a lot of people with these conditions probably Probably shouldn't be taking Gelenia anyways. I should also mention that Gelenia is considered an immunosuppressant, and so vaccines with living components are considered to be contraindicated. Killed vaccines, such as the injectable flu vaccine, are thought to be safe. Now, usually with Gelenia, there aren't a lot of day-to-day -day side effects. So once people are started on it, everything pretty much goes smoothly and swimmingly. But it's a big hassle to start on Gelenia because of all the potential side effects and all of the screening tests that are recommended. For instance, a baseline EKG or electrocardiogram is recommended with electrodes on the chest just to make sure you don't have any serious heart problem that you didn't know about, which would contraindicate the drug. Pulmonary function testing or spirometry to test the lung function is recommended, although not everyone does that. And certain blood tests are recommended, such as antibodies against the virus that causes shingles, and some doctors recommend vaccination if antibodies aren't present. And uh, a baseline eye exam by an ophthalmologist and ocular to computed tomography is recommended before Gelenia and then also four months afterwards. And for the very first dose, you have to set up the first dose observation with an IV line in place and the presence of the drug atropine to give just in case something serious happens with the heart. And you have to wait until the heart rate goes up before 
you can go home and resume the drug normally. So anyways, I'd love to know if you've taken Jelenia and what are your experiences with it, and if you had any side effects, and if you have any suggestions for future videos.